good afternoon and welcome to our final day of Coverings Connected in this afternoon's final webinar, Don't Let Water Be the Boss, Wet Area Tile Installation. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items. This program is AIA accredited for one HSWLU. Please check the chat screen for contact information on how to request your CEU. All attendees are in listen-only mode. You can submit text questions to today's presenter by typing your questions into the questions section of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will share with the presenter during the Q&A at the end of the presentation, getting to as many as time allows. If you are having problems connecting or any other issues, often closing the window and starting a new window will fix the problem. If you are having problems with your computer audio, call the number on your invitation to listen via your phone. The audio pin for this recording is 57 pound or hashtag. There is a handout in the handout section of the portal that all attendees can download. We will also send out after the presentation. This session will be recorded and made available on the Coverings site after Coverings Connected. Don't miss all the other great Coverings Connected opportunities available through coverings.com today. I would now like to introduce our wonderful presenter, Mark Heinlein, the Training Director for the National Tile Contractors Association. Take it away, Mark. Well, Ali, thank you very much for that introduction. It is great to be here at Coverings Connected 2020. Uh, what an honor to have all of you attending with us today. Thank you for taking the time out of your day and being here uh, to learn with all of us about being the boss of water and wet area tile installations. After we get through this presentation, I will put up my email address and the address for the NTCA's technical team. Please make note of those and you can contact us that way with any questions that you might have. Ali mentioned the handouts in our presentation. You can download that handout and that handout will give you all of the source and reference material that I used to put together today's presentation. So please feel free to download that handout and use it. I think you'll find it useful. And thanks for being here. Let's get started with Don't Let Water Be the Boss, Wet Area Tile Installation. Today we're going to learn about the reference material that we use for all installations in wet areas. We'll talk about a variety of the recognized industry methods, standards, details, best practices that go into our wet area installations. And primarily, we'll talk about shower installations and we'll talk about water. We'll talk about how water is both uh, lazy and diligent and how it wants to find a way out of wherever it is. It wants to get out of the systems that we build, but we have to be the boss and manage the flow, manage what water is going to do in every shower that we build. These are the primary documents that we use for all of our tile installations. On the left, we have our ANSI A108 and ANSI A118 and A136. A108 are the installation standards and guides for ceramic tile. On the right, we have the TCNA handbook. The TCNA handbook as I'm sure you already know, is full of methods, details, and the best practices that guide us for all of our installations. And I'm going to start with the TCNA handbook. I'm going to start with the section called the Environmental Exposure Classifications. That section lists two primary categories, a residential category, and a commercial category for environmental exposure. Each of those categories has seven subcategories. Those subcategories range from dry to fully submerged with water and every instance in between. The difference between the residential and the commercial categories is that commercial tends to get a lot more use it's on a lot more than a residential uh, application might be. So some of those uh, requirements for a commercial 
uh, category might be more heavy duty than a residential would be. But when it comes to showers, for instance, that falls in the middle of the range for both residential and commercial. And we'll be talking about commercial and residential category number three, which means that it is regularly subjected to water. Water is routinely in the system that we've constructed or created. And an example of this would be a shower floor. Now let's talk about water for just a minute. In the picture on the right, you, I'm sorry, in the picture on the left, you'll see a roof. And that roof is in the fair city of Portland, Oregon, where they are known to receive a lot of rain. 43 inches annually, that's a lot of rainfall. And in Portland, Oregon and everywhere else, they know how to build a roof properly to keep all of that water out of the structure so it doesn't come in and begin to eat away and damage the structure or the environment in the building. In the picture on the right, we've got a standard small shower. And a family of four that uses that shower every day four showers a day, that shower is going to use a rainfall equivalent of 1,935 inches every year. That's a lot of water. That's 45 times more than they get in Portland, Oregon every year. And we're bringing that water inside the building. We'd better know how to manage that water. Or we could end up with something like this. In the photograph on the left, I'm sure that tile installation looked great after it was installed. It was probably very beautiful. It might have performed well for at least a short period of time. But what the owner and the installer and everyone involved with this installation learned is that it's everything beneath that matters to a wet area installation. Everything that supports the tile layer is so critical to the performance of that wet area. The tile might be important as well. For instance, if there was slate used in this shower, that might not have been the best choice. Maybe a porcelain uh, that had a great slate look could have been a better choice. But once that water got through the tile layer and it found there was no waterproofing, it found it could get into the substrate, and then it found it could get into the framing of the structure beneath everything, it was happy. It found a place to live and allow other things to grow and become a real health hazard. And the whole thing failed. In the picture on the right, that's a, a, a shelf, a corner shelf in a shower that somebody decided they wanted to install. And they used a chunk of two by six. And they took that two by six and plunked it into the corner. And they put the tile and the bond coat around it and probably looked nice uh, for a little while. And it didn't take long for the water to get through that tile layer and just demolish the wood beneath it. I think I even see some moss hanging from the bottom there. That is not how we manage water in a tile installation. Now let's get into some types of showers. There's two basic types. There's a bathtub with a shower head. And then we have our regular showers and a couple of subcategories where we use a prefabricated receptor and a constructed receptor. Before we go there, let's look at a bathtub without a shower head. When you don't have a shower head and there's no water falling from above, there's really no need to manage water that hits at the walls, that's hitting at our tile layer all the time. In the case of a bathtub, water comes out of the faucet, the tub is like a, a big receptor, it holds the water until you're done with it, then you can release it and it goes out into the drain waste vent system. Perfect. Now we don't need to manage the water in a situation like this, but it doesn't hurt. If uh, uh, the kids are splishing and splashing around, might not hurt to have a waterproofing membrane uh, under the water on the splash, under the tub deck, under the apron of the tub. Uh, 
could be a useful thing, but not required. So when does a tub become a shower? Well, when we add that thing right there, as soon as that shower head goes in, we need to start looking at managing the water flow uh, from the tile layer on down. All the way from the top of the tile down to the drain. Now let's talk about these receptors I mentioned. A receptor is a device that acts like a funnel. It collects the water and it routes it down to the drain waste vent system. This picture is an example of a prefabricated receptor, one that was made at a factory and brought onto the job site, installed by the plumber or the mechanical contractor connected to the drain waste vent system. Then the tile contractor comes in and works and installs the rest of the tile layer and the system above that receptor. The TCNA handbook has seven methods, seven details that describe how to install a tile system for a bathtub with a shower head and a shower with a prefabricated receptor. Let's take a look at method B411 right here. This is a method with a prefabricated or tub receptor. It's got a mortar bed wall. If you look at the detail, you can see the cutaway shows a mortar bed wall, the lath, all of the layers that are in place for method B411. B412 is very similar, but this one shifts to a cement backer board or a fiber cement backer board as the substrate on the wall. Now you see that little circled area? We're going to take a look at a variety of changes in plane or where that circled area meets the uh, receptor and see what its job is supposed to do, how it's supposed to look. So let me bring that in a little bit closer for you. What we're looking at here is the stud. You can see the cutaway of the stud and the face of the stud is tight up close to the nailing flange. I've highlighted the nailing flange in green so that you can see it's bound tight to the stud face. Okay, but there's some more detail. I'm gonna bring that in a little bit closer again for you. Here's the stud. Here's that nailing flange in green. Now, do you see that little gap above the nailing flange? That needs to be filled with a shim. We need to fur out that space so that our, our vapor retarder membrane layer, if that's what we're using, I'm showing it in the line in red, has something to rest on and that our substrate, our backer board in this case, can rest on it and be attached to it as well. That's how this system is layered. Now, I know when you look at some of these methods and details, you'll see some wording, something about an option for uh, the membrane being optional. Well, what that means is you may have a vapor retarder membrane, or you might have a surface supplied membrane there's an option to accomplish that if that's the type of board and the type of system that you're using. So here was a tub that had been installed, not following that detail that I just showed you. Now the carpenter roughed in this tub enclosure. The mechanical contractor came in and set the tub. Nobody ever came back and furred out that stub face to match the nailing flange of that tub, did they? Instead, the substrate was applied directly to the, uh, to, uh, to the stud, and it probably dropped down behind that nailing flange. That means it was really hard to make that connection for the waterproofing layer to function properly. Remember that detail? This is what it was supposed to look like. And you can see in that tear out photograph that that didn't happen. It doesn't look correct. It just didn't perform well, did it? Okay, 
let's get into a constructed receptor. This is one that's built in place. This isn't prefab, this isn't fabricated. This is one where we as the tile contractor brings all of the materials into the building. We bring in maybe sand and cement and some lime and some backerboard of some sort. Uh, maybe the drain system is already in place. We bring in the waterproofing layers and all of the materials that we need to piece the constructed receptor together. And that's what I'm going to go through next, is how, how to put the system together. The TCNA handbook methods for constructing shower receptors are listed there on this slide. They're also in the handout that you're going to download. There's 10 of them, and I show, I'm showing one of them, just an example of the detail on the screen. This is more of a cartoon cutaway of a receptor and I want to point out to you the critical components of it. First of all, everything begins from the bottom up with the sloped fill. This is the material that goes on top of the substrate to create a pitch to the low spot of the receptor for water to follow and flow. The sloped fill gets installed first. Without the sloped fill, water has no path to follow and it will start filling up and pooling like in a swimming pool and we're not building swimming pools here we don't want to hold water we want to get rid of water we want to take the water that comes in and route it to the low spot we create the low spot by installing sloped fill then putting a waterproofing liner on top of that sloped fill have it continue up the wall, up, over, and down the face of the curb, and then we connect it to our clamping ring drain assembly with those all important weep holes. The last thing we do is we add our mortar bed on top of that waterproofing layer, on top of that liner, and that mortar bed is held to about an inch and a half thick consistently from all parts of that system on top of the liner. It's not pitched. The sloped fill does all of the pitch. The mortar bed is a consistent inch and a half thick. Okay, here's how we begin that construction. Here's the first step. And this is working over a wood substrate where we take something like a cleavage membrane, uh, could be a variety of material. Here it looks like it's a, a felt uh, sort of roofing paper. And we take expanded metal lath, flat expanded metal lath, and we fasten it down with maybe some staples so it doesn't shift around. The purpose of this is to hang on to that sloped fill that we'll be installing next. And to give that sloped fill, in this case, some dry pack mortar, a chance to cure properly so that wood substrate doesn't draw the hydration out of it, so that it's got a time to cure properly and bond a bit to that substrate. Then we install that material, we pack it in, and we begin to create the slope for the water to flow from the perimeter to the drain and that requirement is one quarter of an inch minimal up to a half inch maximum vertical drop for every 12 inches of horizontal run from the perimeter of the shower receptor to the drain and that drain then becomes the low spot again if this isn't done water will just sit and pool and have nowhere to go and we'll all have a bad day. Here's another type of material that can be used as the sloped fill. This is a, a manufactured foam material with some heavy cardboard on top. It comes in a couple of sizes and you cut it and trim it to fit, extend it a little bit if you need to. And it performs just like that other sloped fill where it routes the water to the drain at a quarter of an inch for every 12 inches. After the sloped fill is in, we move to installing our waterproofing layer. In this case, our pan liner. 
and the pan liner can be made of a PVC material or a CPE material. There are different types. The key component I'm looking at on this slide with you is that our ANSI A108 requires a three inch minimum height above the curve. We need to extend our pan liner up the wall a minimum of three inches above the curb height. And we need to extend it over the top of the curb and down to the floor. I know we've seen this before, but I'm repeating it here because it's very important to know how to install these liners correctly. It all matters. Next, we take the materials that are preformed or manufactured by the liner manufacturer to seal up the corners, the changes in planes from the door jam to the curb top and the inside wall of the shower. It's that compound corner that we need to be concerned with. And in this case, our trainer in the picture on the left has one of these preformed corners. He's putting on some special adhesive that's designed to adhere to that type of material he's working with. Then in the middle picture, he's taking that preformed corner and placing it in that compound corner. Now I wanna point out something here. Do you see that blue tape that's on top of the wood? That tape is there just for training purposes only. Blue tape has no business being in a real world shower installation. Our trainer is working on a training module that we reuse for a lot of different classes. So we use some of that blue tape to protect the wood beneath it. And we take this apart and we have another student use that same module. Never put any blue tape in your actual installations. But look at that photograph on the right. Now you'll see that preformed pre-shaped inside corner placed, and it's going to protect the water at that complicated transition. But we're not done yet. We're taking another one of those, applying the adhesive and putting it on the outside of the curb at that transition. We want to fully waterproof that area because it is so critical and so difficult to do that we need to do it correctly. If you look at the photograph on the right, you'll see the job is nearly complete. And an important thing that you can see is the corners have been folded in the liner very tightly. And they're not bulging out into the system to create a bulge that we have to accommodate with our tile layer. And some adhesive has been applied to keep water from flowing into or up into that corner that's been folded. It's an excellent installation right there. But we're not done yet. We're adding a second topping to both of those inside corners. We're ensuring that we're at at least or more than the three inches above that curb height by applying a rectangular piece of the liner material over the entire installation and sealing it up with that special adhesive. Finally, here's how it looks. Looks great, and you've got an idea of how that will protect the curb and it will keep water from getting into it. Another component of installing the liner is using that adhesive to seal the liner to the drain body. That drain body, if you look at the middle photograph, has a membrane flange on it. The adhesive has been applied to the membrane flange, and now the liner will be brought down over the top of that membrane flange, over the bolts, and pressed into the adhesive so it forms a tight seal. I want to point out one thing here. We did a good job with this. But in that bolt that I've circled, we've got some adhesive around that bolt hole. That means that we might not be able to screw that bolt down very well, or it might mean that we got some adhesive where we don't want it, which would be plugging, uh, plugging a weep hole, and that wouldn't be good. So the purpose of this liner is to rest on top of that tree slope, that sloped fill, 
to route the water down the drain waste vent system. But have you ever heard of a drain backing up? Have you ever heard of a sewer backing up? I don't know if that's ever happened to you. And when that water comes back up out of the system when it's plugged, it could get back into that sloped fill under the liner if our adhesive isn't placed correctly. So make sure that that job is done right. That's a very important detail right there. I've said important detail, I don't know how many times. Every step of the way here is critical to constructing a correct receptor. Finally, we put our clamping collar on top. We tighten it per the manufacturer's instructions. Uh, something like you might tighten a wheel on your car and the system is nearly ready to go. Our next step is to install the top strainer. We dial it down to the finished tile height. And now we're almost ready to put in that mud pack, our mortar bed, but we want to protect our weep holes from becoming clogged with the mortar that we'll be placing there. In the photograph on the right, we've installed a manufactured weep protection system to keep our mortar away from the weep holes, but still allowing the water to percolate through the mortar, to move through the mortar down to that liner waterproofing layer, following the slope into that protection system and out the drain waste vent at the weep holes. On the right, we've used something different. We've used pea gravel, clean washed pea gravel. That will keep the mud from being packed into the weep holes and it will allow the water to percolate more quickly once it hits the pea gravel and out the system. Makes a lot of sense when you think about it, right? Here we are, pretty well installed, almost ready to go, except for the curb. We really haven't addressed the curb yet. Let's take a look at that. The curb needs to have something put on it to hold the tile that we have to bond to it, right? So what we do is we take some more of that metal lath, that flat expanded metal lath, and we form it to fit the size and the shape of the curb. We can actually overform it a little bit to give it a, some spring-like action and set it on the curb and it will grab all by itself. If we find we need to fasten it, you can add a couple of fasteners just on the outside of the curb, down low, nothing on the top, nothing on the inside, just a couple on the outside should do the job. Nowhere that water can attack those fasteners. The reason we put this lath over it is we'll be mixing up some fat mud. We'll be adding a little bit of lime to our recipe and we'll form that curb so that our tile can be bonded to it. Now this curb also has to have that quarter of an inch slope per 12 inches per foot back towards the drain. Here's another way to accomplish that task and that's to use a manufactured curb overlay. Uh, there's several varieties of these available. Uh, they're typically made of foam. They're pre-waterproofed for us at the factory. We cut them to length or size, and we have mix up some thin set mortar, apply it to the liner on top of our curb, put some inside the overlay, press them in place. If we need to put a couple of fasteners, uh, we'll put them on the outside, just like I showed you in the last slide, to hold it in place. And if the overlay doesn't already have a manufactured slope to drain, that's our approach to slope that overlay with the top of it heading back toward the drain. That's how we get the job done. On the NTCA workshop trail, sometimes our trainers are asked, but what about those times where I absolutely must, I've just got to use backer board on my curb. I, I've got to fasten it to that wooden curb. I've got to get the backer board there because that's what the tile has to stick to. Well, in this system, 
in this method where we've got that liner going up and over the top of the curb and down, we don't want to use fasteners. We don't want to use backer board because those fasteners will leak. Remember I said that water is both lazy and diligent? Well, that water will look for the easy way out of the system, but it's also gonna work hard to find that hole that you punctured in the waterproofing layer on top of that curb. And it's going to get in there and it's going to start creating damage. Those fasteners uh, will be a problem. They will leak and we're going to have a failure. No doubt about it. Here's what it looks like after it's failed. Now this one might have some more issues as well. The liner wasn't placed correctly, but certainly that backer board, the fasteners driven into it didn't help one little bit. Curbs will fail and we don't want to see that happen in anyone's installation. Our next step after we get the liner in place and everything ready to go, is to put in our mud bed, our mortar bed. And ANSI A108 gives us a variety of recipes for a site mix for that dry pack mud. In this case, it tells us that four parts sand, one part Portland cement, a little bit of water, you mix it up, you make sure that it doesn't really stick together hard, that it will fall apart when you form a ball, when you tap at the ball, that if you drop that ball like a snowball, it'll easily break apart. That's what we want to have in this system. We want to pack that in to our liner to have it follow that inch and a half thickness from the perimeter down towards the drain strainer that you see at the low point. You want to maintain that inch and a half mortar bed thickness while you're doing that. Then you can see our completed curb where we've made some fat mug to shape that curb. And now we can adhere our tile to that rather than having to resort to a backer board type system that can fail. This system will work great for a long time. Let's review just a little bit. I talked about sloped fill a number of times. It, everything begins at the bottom and works its way up. The sloped fill at the bottom of our installation is a very critical component to have the pitch for water to flow to the drain waste vent system. On top of that, we put our membrane, our waterproofing layer that must extend three inches above the curb height, we keep the weep holes open, keep the path for water to flow free and open. We provide that slope to drain of a quarter of an inch minimum up to a half inch maximum for every 12 inches horizontal run on every horizontal surface, on the receptor, on the curb top, on the bench or the seat, on the shelf, everywhere we have a horizontal surface, we want that slope to drain. And we want to flood test the system before we install tile. That's a very important thing to do because number one, just like the uniform plumbing code requires the slope to drain, local codes often require an inspector to come in and see the flood test. If they don't require that in your local jurisdiction, I recommend you do it anyway. It's a best practice. You want to find out if there's any leaks before you go any further. Let's take a look at a few problem areas. I, I can see a few right here and I wanna point some out. Look at that jam. There's none of that very uh, uh, important area where that jam to curb top transition has been protected so that water can't get in there and attack the wood. That doesn't exist here. There's no waterproofing at that jam. That will be a failure right away. 
I see some fasteners beneath the water line. Remember I mentioned the three inches above the curb height for that membrane? Let's keep our fasteners up higher at that level where they won't be down in that water line area where the mud will be. And speaking of that mud that's going to be on top of that liner, I see that this panel, which happens to be a fiber cement backer board, which is a great product, but it was installed incorrectly in this case. It was brought all the way down to the liner with the expectation that the mud will be packed up next to it. That's not the correct way to install that material. We'll talk about that more in a few minutes. And the last thing I see in this picture is the seat that we're seeing at the bottom of the photograph. There's no waterproofing there and you can see some fasteners and you can see some backer board that's on top of the seat that the fasteners are holding down. And you can imagine that those fasteners have poked holes through that waterproofing liner layer. And guess what's gonna happen? It's going to leak. I also happen to know there's no slope to the drain on that seat. So it's a disaster just waiting to happen. Here's a look at a bench and a shower in a finished installation. It takes a lot of water. Remember how much water a shower takes every year? The tile layer does its job, but everything else we've talked about up to this point, everything that's beneath that tile layer will help the whole system hold together for the life of the installation, which is a very long time. Let's look at a few other types of systems. I've been talking about the types of systems that use a sloped fill. If you look at the photograph, you'll see that we're using a surface applied membrane. If you look at the detail on the left, look where we normally see the sloped fill. There's no sloped fill in that detail. All of the waterproofing in this installation is a surface applied waterproofing. And this one uses a, a flashing. I've highlighted the flashing in red on that cutaway detail. Let me point it out here on the photograph. That's the piece I'm talking about after it's been installed. This flashing is designed to bring the waterproofing uh, from the top of the mud deck to connect it down to the bottom of the clamping ring drain between the clamping collar and the drain body at the membrane flange. We use that adhesive, clamp in that flashing, and we create this system where we can use a clamping ring drain and a surface applied membrane. I just brought up the membrane layer that runs up the wall substrate, then down, and it makes the transition at the change in plane to the top of the receptor, and we see that all of the pitch, all of that quarter inch for every 12 inches uh, run is in the top of the mud deck on this one. It connects up to that uh, flashing, down to the weep holes and out the drain waste vent system. Great system when installed correctly. Let's take a look at a similar but somewhat different system again, this one does not have that tree slope. The waterproofing is done on top of the system. The slope is done on top of the receptor, on top of the mud pack. And this one uses something called an integrated bonding flange drain. That bonding flange drain has been placed into the mud. Then the surface applied membrane runs down the wall. Remember the finished tile height down the wall makes that change in plane where the wall meets the top of the receptor, follows the path to the top of the integrated bonding flange and out the drain waste vent system. The last two methods are methods in the TCNA handbook, methods B421 and B422. Okay, we've been talking about receptors. We've been talking about the floors, the pans of the shower system. Let's get a little bit more into the wall substrate area. 
Method B415, if you're a CTI or you know somebody who wants to become a CTI, they will become familiar with method B415 as they prepare to take their evaluation for certified tile installer. These are two details discussed by method B415, and we have to be aware of what backer board we're installing at any given time. They both can be used in this installation. The detail on the left uses cement backer board. Look at that circled area I've been having you look at you'll see that the cement backer board is actually inserted into the mud bed. It can go down into the mud bed and form, uh, perform very well right there. The detail on the right uses a fiber cement backer board. Look again at that circled area. This time a gap is required from the top of the mud bed to the bottom of the fiber cement backer board. That's to keep that backer board performing well for a long time during the life of the installation. We know to do this because the manufacturer's instructions have gone into writing this method and writing this detail. And they tell us how to install their products on the backer board and where they should be placed in relation to the rest of the components of the system. This is why we must know what our materials are every time we look at them and how to apply them and install them so they've performed correctly. Here's another detail, <clears throat> detailed method B426 for cementitious coated extruded foam backer board. That's a fun one to say. When you look at the detail on the right, you'll see that that substrate can be inserted into the mud. Two more methods shown on this screen, methods B420 and B431. These are for coated glass mat water-resistant gypsum backer board and fiber-reinforced water-resistant gypsum backer board. Again, look at the circled area. Both of these boards require a gap between the bottom of the board and the top of the mud bed in the receptor. They also require a flexible seal excuse me, flexible sealant between the changes in plane between the bottom of the board and the top of the pan. We Once again, we get this information from, from the board manufacturer. Their instructions will give you the details on why that's required and how to properly install their board. So once all that is done, we can get on to our waterproofing layer. On the left, we can do our sheet applied waterproofing one way. On the right, we can do our liquid applied waterproofing. Let's look at the sheet applied waterproofing on the left. I see an integrated bonding flange drain in that system. I see the sheet applied waterproofing that's been applied using the manufacturer's instructions uh, and a thin set mortar application. Uh, if you look with me into that inside corner and over the curb, I can see some of those preformed corners to make certain that those changes in plane at those compound points are protected from water intrusion. I can see that the waterproofing layer has come up over and down the face of the curb and even out into the rest of the uh, bathroom area. Great installation right there. On the right, that liquid applied waterproofing is also being used with an integrated bonding flange drain. And I can see that uh, the installer is using a paintbrush and a paint roller and a paint tray to apply this. Well, that's one way to do it, but I'm here to tell you that stuff isn't paint. We don't apply it like paint, although we can use those tools. We can also use a trowel we can also use a sprayer, but we need to follow the manufacturer's instructions on the back of that bucket to tell us how to apply it and how thick to apply it. Here's an installer using a paint roller. You can tell that a lot of material is on that roller. He's doing it correctly. He's putting a sufficient amount of wet film that will cure to the right thickness 
to make sure that the uh, membrane cures correctly and becomes a waterproofing layer in this system. How does that installer know how thick to put it? Well, he uses a wet film thickness gauge. Here's one right here. Well, I, the film is still wet. Its gauge is placed into the wet film. You see those numbers going across the bottom, 30, 28, 26, 24, 22. Those mark the number of mils that the tab beneath it are above the surface of the substrate, okay? Do you know what a mill is? A mill is one one thousandth of an inch. That's not much. So in this case, we're looking for 22 mils. I'm pointing to the 22 mil mark. It's really hard for me to see whether that little tab beneath the 22 mil mark is touching the surface of the wet film. So what we do is we pull this gauge out of the material and we place it on a piece of paper, lay it back, and we can tell where the tab has hit the liquid film. That's how we know that we've achieved 22 mils, for instance, in this case. Here are all the tabs that have touched, the left foot, the right foot, tab 14, 16, 18, 20, and 22 have touched. Tab 24 has not touched. So in the case of this manufacturer's product, if we were looking for 22 mils, we've got it. We can spot check ourselves all the way throughout the installation to see how we're doing and do that quality control check on ourselves to make sure we're installing the material correctly. Some liquid membranes come with a fabric reinforcement. You put on the membrane, you put the reinforcement into the membrane, then put some more of the liquid on top of that fabric reinforcement. Works great. All of the instructions for this are on the back of the bucket. Read that and it will tell you for this product how thick to make it to be a waterproofing layer. Finally, we're to that flood test. We blocked off our drain waste fence system. We put a mark on the wall, usually about two inches above the lowest point in the system, and that lowest point would be the drain, right? So we put a mark on the wall, we fill the water up to that mark, and we go away for 24 hours. Go find something else to do. Go set tile in the other room tomorrow. Then come back after 24 hours. See if your water is still at that mark. If it hasn't leaked anywhere, it should still be right up to that mark you placed on the wall. If you require an inspection, the inspector will take a look at this, and they will usually want to be the ones that pull the plug and watch the water go out of the system. So when that happens, Drain the water, dry it up. Now you're ready to get on with your installation. And that includes setting tile. When we set tile, <clears throat> we select the right mortar for the job. We select the right trowel and we hold the trowel at the correct angle and we trowel in the correct direction which is parallel to the short side of the tile, like I'm showing here. Then we place our tile, we press on it, we shift it one way, then back the other way to collapse those ridges. When we're all done, we want to have 95% coverage that meets the ANSI A108 and TCNA handbook requirements for average contact in a wet area. Why do we have that? We have that so there's no voids in the bond coat behind our tile. This installer did a great job. Do you see in the photo on the left, some staining on that tile? That's not just wet tile, that is stained tile. Here, I'll highlight them for you in case you can't see them. 
That's where those stains are in that tile. Sometimes exploratory surgery has to be done to figure out what's happening in an installation. So in this case, some exploratory surgery was done, the tile layer was opened up, and we see some voids. We see some trowel marks, but they don't run in those straight lines. Uh, we see some dots, maybe some spots, and boy, the whole thing came together and created a bad situation. Now I've highlighted those voids where we did the surgery. Can you line those up to the staining that you see in the tile on the left? Yeah, kind of tells the story, right? That's what happens when water gets behind the tile and it's stored in these voids where we don't get 95% coverage. Here's another look at another installation where the installer didn't understand the importance of straight line troweling or selecting the right size trowel or shifting the tile back and forth. Instead, they resorted to this uh, five spot method where you put one in each corner, one in the middle, and he was probably ending up with a fairly flat finished surface, but it didn't last very long, did it? It didn't last long enough to finish the job before somebody realized it was being done incorrectly. Speaking of voids, this is a shower under demolition. We're looking at the edge of a piece of tile. We're looking at the cured bond coat on the backside of the tile. We're looking at ridges that the installer troweled, straight ridges, straight line troweling. He probably used the right size trowel, probably used the right mortar, probably did everything correctly except for collapsing those ridges by shifting the tile side to side, collapsing the ridges. Instead, he just sort of pressed it on and ended up with many, many voids that caused this failure. We've seen this before, and we know that it probably looked good when it started, but it sure isn't looking good now. We see a lot of efflorescence. We see probably mold and mildew and other terrible things coming through the system, and we've got an idea of what's going on beneath all of that. We've got an idea that our installation wasn't done correctly, that nothing really happened right. And in the end, when the exploratory surgery had to happen, all of those things were discovered. This installer did not know that they had to be the boss of water, didn't know the industry standards, methods, best practices, and techniques that we've been talking about today, and it resorted in an ultimate failure. I don't want you to have those. So we've talked about the library of documents that we use to guide our installations in wet areas. We've looked at many of the details that go into the installations that we use to create a shower assembly, the walls, the pans, the waterproofing layers. We've looked at the pathways water travels. We talked about what water does, how it's lazy, and at the same time works hard to find a path out of the system. And we've learned that it's us that has to know how to manage the flow of water and be the boss of water in a shower system and a wet area. So that's what I've got on this presentation. I've got my email address listed there. It's mark at tile-assn.com the email address for NTCA's technical team, technical at pile-assn.com. When you deal with the NTCA, you're dealing with people who have a great knowledge of the tile industry standards, and we're there to help you to ensure you don't have a problem with the tile installation that you're specifying or designing or installing. And we want to help, there, help you and be there for you before you start before there's a problem. So thanks for attending. 
Thanks for listening. And Allie, I'm wondering if you have anything else for us. We do have some questions. We have time for a couple of questions. So I'm gonna read a couple of them. The first one is, there are some linear drains on the market that are not designed with weep holes. Do you have any reservations using these? That is a terrific question. Um, linear drains on the market, uh, they're a, a great product. They have a great look and a terrific design feature in the shower. And I caution everyone to make sure that they thoroughly research the drain that they're installing. Speak with the manufacturer and completely understand all of the aspects of the drain. Understand how it meshes to the wall or how it meshes to the floor, how it works with the waterproofing layer on top of the system, how drain uh, water gets into the uh, strainer part, and how it's evacuated throughout the system. The manufacturer can help you understand how their drains work and how they're installed within a system and make sure that you do it per their instructions so that they will support you with the installation that you're creating. Great, here is another good question. Can you go into more detail on the difference between gypsum backer boards and gypsum wall board and when they're appropriate for wet area installation? Terrific question, Allie. Um, that, that is a very, uh, on one hand, easy question, and on uh, the other hand, a difficult question. You probably heard me mention uh, that you should contact the manufacturer to ask them about their backer board to ensure they, can, they, they uh, will allow it to be installed in a wet area or not. It is important to know that a gypsum board may not sometimes be allowed in a wet area. Our TCNA handbook, Methods and Details, will help you decipher this. But more importantly, the manufacturer will tell you if their particular board is designed to function well in a wet area using the TCNA handbook method or not. If there's a proprietary method or system from a manufacturer that allows their board or their material to be used in a wet area, you need to follow their instructions very carefully to ensure that their product will perform and support your installation in a wet area. I mentioned in, uh, in fact, I think I very clearly described some of the differences between the different types of backer boards in the different installations uh, in the handbook's approved methods. And it shows that they must be installed in a different manner. The manufacturers of these systems, of these boards, will be able to provide you very detailed instructions to help you answer your questions on that. Wonderful, okay, uh, last question. Are there any specific ways to double check to see that the shower pan is in fact watertight? Well, the specific way to double check to make sure it's watertight is to do the water test. Get your pan uh, installed, constructed to the point, whether you're using a clamping ring drain or an integrated bonding flange drain or a uh, linear drain or any type of drain, plug that drain with a device that's made for that job. Make sure all of your uh, waterproofing layer is intact and in place. Fill that system with water a couple of inches higher than the lowest point, which would be right at the drain and let it sit. Put that mark on the wall. You can use tape to mark it, use a, a marker and let it sit, come back, check on it every so often, come back in 24 hours. And if it hasn't budged, very likely you've got a watertight system and it's ready for the next step, the next phase of your installation. Wonderful. Um, I know we didn't get to all the questions today, but we will be sharing the question law with Mark and uh, you see both of the email addresses. You can send questions to him directly or to the technical folks over at NTCA. 
Thank you again, Mark, for sharing that wonderful presentation. Thank you to everyone who's attended Coverings Connect, not just today, but the whole week. We really appreciate your support. Uh, once you leave today's webinar, you're gonna receive a survey on the presentation. Uh, it's short, I promise, and we would appreciate if you would complete it and provide your feedback. Coverings 2021 will take place April 13th through 16th back in Orlando, Florida. Please look for more information on that in the coming months. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Mark. Um, and thank you for being a part of Coverings Connected. Please stay safe and healthy. Thank you. And thanks everyone for being here.